you all for standing by and welcome to the 27th webinar of our series entitled Climate and Carbon Impact on Productivity, Chemistry, and Invasive Species in the Great Lakes. These webinars are an initiative of the Ohio State University Climate Change Outreach Team, a multi-departmental effort within the university led by OSU Extension, Ohio Sea Grant, Bird Polar Research Center, and several other university departments to help localize the climate change issue for Ohioans and Great Lakes residents. I'm Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today is Dr. Galen McKinley. Dr. McKinley is an Associate Professor of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences at the University of Wisconsin and a faculty affiliate of the Center for Climatic Research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Nelson Institute. She uses numerical models and data to study how physical and biogeochemical processes influence carbon cycling and its temporal variability in the oceans and the Great Lakes. We're delighted to have her here today. Before we get started, a few logistical issues. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, at about 1240, we'll conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, and I will collect and pose your questions out to Dr. McKinley at the end of her presentation. We have more than 600 participants registered for this webinar, a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from around the Great Lakes and the, across the country. Please Keep those questions coming throughout the presentation, and we should have a great Q&A session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes to fill that survey out. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Galen McKinley from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who will present climate and carbon impacts on productivity, chemistry, and invasive species in the Great Lakes. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you to everyone who's here to listen. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited to have this opportunity to share with you some of what we're learning about how climate change and uh, uh, other uh, variables are impacting our Great Lakes and its ecology. I want to begin by, uh, let me see. Advancing the slide, uh, there we go. <laughs> I want to begin by thanking uh, uh, many people who I've been working with on these issues. Uh, first to Val Bennington, who uh, was my student here at UW-Madison, and really the research uh, that uh, we're going to be talking about today was originated uh, much in her PhD thesis. Also, thank you to Colleen Mao, Noel Urban, and Marty Auer at Michigan Tech, Jim Kitchell and Limnology at UW-Madison, to two current students in my research group, and to funding, which is primarily from the National Science Foundation, with uh, also support from CTR and CPEP and Sea Grant. So uh, to begin to describe what is this biogeochemistry word that was used in the introduction. Biogeochemistry is elemental cycling and fluxes of those elements between different, re different reservoirs and those interactions with the lower food web. And uh, in order for uh, humans to grow, we need to have food and, and vitamins, uh, and that's also true for things like phytoplankton that end up supporting fish. So, so shown here on the left-hand side is a schematic of uh, this kind of cycling where we have different forms of nitrogen, different uh, some phosphates, some micronutrients, and carbon dioxide being cycled through um, a um, ecosystem that includes some uh, phyto, some phytoplankton here, some zooplankton, and then up to higher trophic levels with some waste products sinking down perhaps into the deeper parts of an aquatic body, whether that be the oceans or a lake, and then also cycling through other parts of uh, the uh, ecology in the lower food web. And then shown on the right is just some of the, an indication of some of those fluxes uh, between uh, different reservoirs. So biogeochemistry is a cycling of elements that really supports lower food web uh, uh, and uh, productivity. Now, biogeochemistry in turn is really set uh, in its set the stage for that biogeochemistry, really set by the physics of how aquatic bodies move around. So here is an example from the subtropical North Atlantic where we have the great gyre here, 
uh, with the center being the Sargasso Sea, and here's the Gulf Stream here, a very important uh, current. And, uh, and this uh, circulation is one that causes water to spend long uh, periods of time in the surface ocean, converging towards the center of the gyre. And as it does that, the nutrients get stripped out, used up, and this leads to, in the satellite chlorophyll picture, very low chlorophyll uh, and in the um, subtropical gyre. So this is what we consider an ocean desert, where there's not very much productivity compared to, for example, the northern latitudes in the subpolar gyre, where we have a very different physics and therefore a lot greater productivity. And so this is also true in the Great Lakes, that the physics really are setting the stage for a lot of the biogeochemistry at the lake-wide scale. And this physics uh, is not um, uh, just a smooth uh, ribbons of water moving around. In fact, it is filled with all the same kinds of eddies and variability. This is the Gulf Stream shown in the figure here. Uh, all this uh, amazing variability that's really quite comparable uh, physically to the weather variability that we have uh, affecting where we live here in the middle latitudes. And so all this variability uh, is also occurring in the Great Lakes. So I'm going to switch over here and show you a movie uh, of, uh, that really uh, gives you some uh, just a visual feeling for that variability in the Great Lakes. This is a realistic uh, numerical model of the circulation of Great Lakes, uh, of Lake Superior, excuse me here, uh, forced with the meteorology of um, uh, real meteorology uh, from data and numerical models of the atmosphere. And into this uh, model, we put uh, just sort of a, a tracer, a, uh, a blob of stuff, you could say, released on the top at the St. Louis River on January 1st and released on the bottom at the Otsnagan River mouth on January 1st. And these are flowing around the Great Lakes. Uh, and in here, if the, the color is... Um, orange, orange to yellow, uh, at a concentration of one, it, that is the concentration that the whole lake would have if the lake were fully mixed with this stuff. And, and what you can see here, uh, more than a year and a half into the animation, that the stuff that was released at the St. Louis River really still has barely gotten to uh, the open waters of the Eastern Basin, while the stuff released at the Otanagan uh, is much more well distributed. So there's a lot of variability uh, in how things move around in these lakes, uh, and, um, and it's a very uh, complex patterns of that, of that circulation and complex distributions of, um, of nutrients. And I want to submit to you, and I want to try to uh, talk about this uh, here today, that together it is the physics and the biogeochemistry of the lakes that really are the infrastructure on which our ecosystems depend. So to have commercial fisheries, recreational fisheries, bird populations that depend on, on the fish availability, uh, to have clean drinking water, uh, recreational opportunities, to really understand how these ecosystems work, how the ecosystem services uh, work and can be, continue to be provided to us, we really need to also understand those underlying infrastructures of the physics and the biogeochemistry. And those are the links I want to uh, talk about today. Uh, and of course, climate change is certainly here. Uh, here is a, a plot from the New York Times just uh, about a week ago showing uh, the record-setting heat across the U.S. in 2012. Uh, this is the warmest year uh, since records began in 1895. And you can see that the Great Lakes region is really kind of in the bullseye of that warming. And so clearly uh, this is something that we need to be uh, concerned about for our region, which is a of course, the topic of this entire webinar series. Um, and we know that the Great Lakes are feeling the heat. They are certainly warming. This is data taken from uh, three sites uh, in the central lake from the NBDC buoys here uh, uh, in, in Lake Superior. Uh, and you can see these positive trends in temperature from 85 to about 2007 here, where the stars here are the lake temperature and the crosses are the air temperature. Both are going up, uh, and, uh, and this warming uh, is, is, is very significant, very rapid compared to other uh, bodies of water. For example, the global oceans cool, are warming as well, but not quite so quickly. 
So how is this physical change uh, going to, uh, driven by climate change, uh, and other stressors as well, going to impact ecosystems? That's what we would really like to know. Here is a very recently published uh, uh, analysis of all of the different stressors on the Great Lakes. Uh, so shown here where blue means one to four number of stressors above the mean level of stress. So Lake Superior has relatively lower values while the lower lakes have higher values and the coastal regions have higher values, up to 28 stressors above mean uh, in the red there. And on the left here are all of these stressors. Uh, categorized under toxics, runoff, invasives, fisheries, coastal development, climate change, and aquatic habitats. So you see climate change is in there, uh, and so that's warming, ice cover, water levels, uh, but in fact this analysis just sums up these individual stressors one after the other and does not consider the potential for nonlinear effects or uh, effects where, for example, warming might affect the um, uh, uh, the performance uh, or the uh, prey, um, uh, preying ability of an invasive species like the sea lamprey, uh, and therefore that might affect the fish. So these nonlinear effects are really important and probably uh, going to be uh, pretty critical, but we really are only beginning to develop linear assessments of these stressors, let alone nonlinear ones that really put the whole thing together. So we have a long way to go in terms of really understanding the impacts of climate change. We have to start thinking about nonlinear effects and to get there we need to understand the physics and the biogeochemistry of these systems uh, because they are a critical part of that. Further, uh, warming is due to anthropogenic CO2. This is the iconic Mauna Loa curve uh, from NOAA and Scripps showing the long-term increase in CO2 in the atmosphere and this is of course due primarily to fossil fuel burning uh, by humans. And this CO2 enters a very complicated and fascinating uh, carbon cycle. This is a global carbon cycle estimate from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, fourth assessment report in 2007. These numbers in pentagrams of carbon per year uh, are um, estimates of the 1990s numbers, uh, but um, for the global scale, how much carbon is in the atmosphere, how much carbon is in the surface ocean, with the black here are the estimates of how much was there before uh, a human started putting CO2 in the atmosphere, and the red is the modifications to that because of anthropogenic activities. Um, you will notice, of course, that great, the Great Lakes are certainly not included here, and that even inland waters as represented by a river here is just a conduit of material coming off the land and the soil through the river into the ocean. There's no actual processing here or, or things changing in those inland waters. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what we're learning about how the Great Lakes actually do play a role in the carbon cycle uh, uh, and uh, trying to quantify what that role is. These numbers are in uh, petagrams of carbon per year. The Great Lakes uh, role is definitely smaller, but still uh, important to understand. So we're going to talk about advancing understanding of Great Lakes biogeochemistry and physics. And I'm going to bring up four critical issues. First, I want to talk about the carbon budget of Lake Superior, talk about energy sources for Dipariah in Lake Superior. I want to talk about the effects of warming on the sea lamprey in Lake Superior. And then finally, talk about ocean acidification in the Great Lakes. So first, the carbon budget of Lake Superior. Now here's an example of, of a place where uh, one kind of evidence of, of a, things that we need to learn more about in order to be able to predict global, global change impacts. So to begin with, inland waters really may be a play a significant role in the carbon cycle. Shown here, uh, numbers from coal and at all 2007 and Transic 2009, suggesting that these inland waters as a whole, so, uh, so uh, uh, dams, uh, uh, dammed regions, reservoirs, lakes, rivers, streams, all of them globally estimating these numbers, 
that if off the land comes between two and three petagrams of carbon per year into these inland waters, it isn't just a straight pipe out to the ocean, but there's actually a lot of processing of, that goes on in those inland waters that results in the sediment storage of 10 to 20 percent of the input and of CO2 evasion of 40 to 50 percent uh, of that input. And then uh, about one petagram of carbon per year, 30 to 50 percent, actually makes it all the way out to the ocean. So for all inland waters, we're just beginning to really think about how they might play a role in the global carbon cycle. So that has led us to think about, well, what's the role of, of the lake that's the largest by surface area in the world, Lake Superior? And we started by saying, well, what do we know about Lake Superior's carbon budget based on previous estimates? And we have, we have numbers for, for example, inputs from rivers, burial in the sediments, outflow at the St. Mary's, efflux to the atmosphere, uh, atmospheric deposition, relatively small numbers, all of those. And then the bigger numbers are the net productivity in the surface lake, how much of phytoplankton net uh, fixing carbon from inorganic to, car to uh, organic forms. And then estimate of respiration, how much of that carbon is getting used up as a food source for everything else in the lake. And the problem we've identified is that the input numbers, if you sum them up, 6.6 .6 to 11.1, are not equal to the outputs, 16.6, 45.6. So, so our budget isn't working out. We're not putting enough in to balance what's going out, and there's no evidence of a long-term large increase in the reservoir there, so we must not have one of these numbers right. And that's what we've been, uh, one of the things we've worked on is to try to, try to figure that out. So uh, again, we're going to talk about uh, a project here with the numerical model of Lake Superior. This is another animation. This is showing the temperatures in the lake and the velocities in the lake cycling through a year here. We're in April uh, and it's starting in June uh, and into July, warming the lake. Uh, uh, you can see the Keweenaw current developing uh, and then cooling off into October, November, uh, and into December. So we have a model that represents the physics of the lake. And before we go on and say, well, this tells us something about carbon, we need to begin by validating that model, the physics of that model. And we do that with some data that was taken in 1999 at the point in the red, red star there off the Keweenaw during the Kites experiment here. And on the uh, top left, we have the data for velocities in the east-west direction. On the top right, we have modeled velocities. And uh, this is going through time from um, June through December when the observations were taken. And you can see uh, that, for example, uh, when there was a very uh, fast current here in mid-September, that also occurred in the model. And similarly, in early October, that also occurred in the model. Uh, and so the model is capturing certainly the variability in the physics reasonably well. Uh, some of the details certainly aren't exactly perfect, but it's a, it's a reasonably high fidelity simulation of those velocities. Uh, the temperature also we can look at uh, between the model on the right and the data on the left. And the model is getting the right timing of the warming in the lake and the breakdown of stratification, but it is a little bit warm. Uh, and we understand the reasons for that. Uh, and we, but, and uh, but on the whole, you know, it's a pretty good simulation, certainly not perfect. We understand some of the biases. And that's an important part of using a model is understanding the quality of your tool. So then next we can couple into this physical model a lower food web and biogeochemistry module where we represent with equations uh, the cycling of nutrients, phosphorus is our macronutrient here, and carbon, how it interacts with oxygen in the water, and going through a, a cycle where we have phytoplankton eating up the nutrients and taking up carbon, and those are being eaten by zooplankton. Some of those are dying or excreting uh, into dissolved and particulate pools, and this can get recycled through, through the system. And again, we want to validate our model to, to make sure we don't have uh, just a, a totally crazy world here. And for, for that, I'm going to just show you our comparison to nearshore respiration from the kites experiment where here the red is observations, uh, and there's one purple point as well, slightly deeper observation. Uh, and the black is the model uh, at the surface, and the blue is the model at the next level down, five to 10 meters. 
And you can see that the model certainly is um, consistent with the data at the large scale. There are certainly some cases where the model underestimates the total amount of respiration and some uh, occasions when it overestimates it. But if you look at it, I think you would say that this is a reasonable estimate of the respiration that occurred at this time. And now the benefit of the model is that the model tells us what the respiration is, not only at these points through time, but what it was across the whole lake, or it gives us a reasonable estimate of what that was once we validate it against these data and against other observations. So it gives us a way to kind of reasonably extrapolate the data from a few points um, that were, you know, uh, collected um, from ships, very intensive um, time and labor-wise to capture those observations. With the model, we can make a reasonable estimate of what happened across the lake. And so we've done that in the interest of better understanding this term, the respiration term, in our carbon budget that we said before was unbalanced, where our inputs are not equaling our outputs. Uh, and the model, in fact, indicates a factor of 10 variation in respiration of volumetric rates across the lake. So much higher respiration rates in the near shore region uh, and much, much lower rates. Um, here is a, it's an exponential scale um, in the um, logarithmic scale uh, in the uh, open lake. And so the past estimates have used only a factor of two with respect to the observations of the Keweenaw uh, to get to this 13 to 42 teragrams of carbon per year estimate, while our model suggests, in fact, only about five and a half teragrams of carbon per respiration would be consistent with those observations in the near shore zone. So with that, we can redo uh, this uh, carbon budget, change the respiration term, uh, uh, taking the spatial pattern from the model and the observed numbers, scaling with the spatial pattern of the, of the model, to get a, a best estimate of the respiration, 4.3 to 5.6 teragrams of carbon per year. If we include that in the budget, now our inputs and our outputs are, are within you know, the same re reasonable bounds, and we can begin to say we think we have a balanced carbon budget for Lake Superior. With respect to the global estimate, um, which was in tetragrams of carbon per year, as I mentioned before, this is uh, 10 uh, to the, the thousand times smaller. So this is not a huge source to the atmosphere on the global scale, uh, but, um, but, it, but, but it's an indicator uh, of how well we understand some of the basic biogeochemistry of the lake by the fact that we can balance this budget. Uh, and for the other lakes, the other Great Lakes, we don't have as good a handle on what those budgets are. And so that's something that needs to be, be worked on for all the Great Lakes so that we can understand how carbon, which is this very important um, element that is kind of that fundamental driver of climate change, is cycling through these systems. I now want to briefly talk about how we've used the same numerical modeling effort to look at energy sources for dipariah in Lake Superior. Now, dipariah is a critical macroinvertebrate in uh, the Great Lakes, uh, and it, um, it actually uh, uh, used to be the dominant macroinvertebrate in all the Great Lakes. Uh, it's a significant contributor to fish diets in Lake Superior, uh, including those with commercial and recreational importance, such as whitefish and lake trout. Um, in other Great Lakes, dramatic declines in the uh, dipariah have been documented, including extirpation from Lake, Superior, lake uh, Erie, excuse me. Um, and uh, it is, there's some theories out there, such as competition with the invasive uh, dressinid mussels might be a reason for this, ex, uh, this dramatic decline, uh, but no clearly uh, agreed on cause and effect relationship is, is out there. Uh, but in Lake Superior, dipariah is still thriving, and so it's very interesting to try to understand what, what allows this important macroinvertebrate, this important keystone species, to exist uh, and where does it exist. So Marty Auer and collaborators at, at, at Michigan Tech have done a lot of work trying to understand the distribution of dipariah and find that the numbers of dipariah cluster uh, in, in the slope region. So this is a... Uh, a um, kind of a summary transect uh, from zero uh, water depth out to 300 meters water depth and showing that the dipariah communities have a preference for this region between about 50 and 150 meter water depth. And the question is, why is that the case? 
And this is particularly interesting uh, because productivity is highest in the near shore. As we've shown, respiration is highest in the near shore. Uh, this is a map of chlorophyll after uh, estimated by an algorithm from Colleen Mao at MTU. Um, after the, this is after the removal of a terrestrial uh, dissolved matter signal that's very large. And you can see in this chlorophyll plot that there is a lot of variability in chlorophyll concentration in the lake on this one day, August 31st, 2006, and that the most of the productivity, particularly here in the, in the um, on the Keweenaw really is highest when the reds along along the coast. Um, and so if that's where the productivity is greater and the, the uh, dipariah probably would be eating uh, whatever uh, is being produced there, why aren't they also greatest there where the productivity is greater? What we've done is we've used our numerical model to ask the question of how much and where does production and respiration of labile organic carbon occur in Lake Superior. We're evaluating that using our numerical model. What I'm showing here is an estimate of labile organic carbon uh, production and respiration in a nearshore zone, less than 50 meters water depth, in a slope zone, 50 to 150 meters water depth, and then an offshore zone uh, greater than 150 meters depth. And um, what you'll note uh, is that there's a small subsidy of labile organic matter uh, from the rivers. This goes into the nearshore zone, but in that nearshore zone, the production and the respiration actually balance each other so that their ratio is about one. And an amount of organic matter kind of equivalent to that river input is actually being transported offshore by those eddies shown in the first animation, by these waves of, 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 of small-scale processes moving through the lake and sweeping high concentrations of material from near to offshore. And that is supporting additional respiration here in the slope zone, where we have, still have uh, significant production, uh, but the respiration is just a little bit higher than that production, so that the R to P ratio there is about 4% elevated. So there's a little bit of a subsidy of, of, of matter that uh, can be used up in that uh, slope zone. And then there's a little bit of export of stuff going off to the offshore zone, but essentially that region is balanced in its production and respiration numbers. So what we're suggesting here is that it might be a reason for the, the dipariah to be clustered in that slope region is because there's this subsidy uh, by material being evicted from the nearshore zone into that slope zone and respired, respired there. Um, and so uh, this is, this, is uh, the, this little part about the dipari and energy sources that might help support their communities on the slope. The next issue I wanted to talk about is a sea lamp rays in Lake Superior and how warming uh, might be driving uh, this um, uh, increase in the sea lamprey. Now, what are the sea lamprey? Uh, they are an invasive parasitic fish uh, shown in these pictures here uh, that uh, came into the Great Lakes in uh, the 1800s with the completion of uh, the Erie and Welland Canals. Uh, and fall, in the following century, they really spread to all the lakes, and their abundance really started to rise in the 1900s and caused a significant uh, collapse of many commercial fisheries in the um, mid-century, and this is what led to the formation of the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission in 1955. And by 1958, there was a uh, program initiated to use lamprecide in streams and rivers every year to kill the early life stages of the sea lamprey, such that to this day, uh, this application continues to keep these populations of these um, uh, parasites down to about 5% of their potential total. Um, and without that ongoing use of the lamprecide, uh, fish, fish populations would be decimated once again. So this is a very critical um, uh, battle we continue to fight with the sea lamprey. Now I want to talk about how uh, warming uh, might be affecting the sea lamprey. Um, and so um, uh, what's been observed, here's a time series of uh, uh, catch per unit effort for trout from the far left hand side is 1950 uh, and about uh, 2005 is on the right. And you can see that there was a real dramatic decline here with the sea lamprey really doing their thing um, and, and uh, continuing to decline here. 
But but then once we started doing the Lambertine in 58, the trout started uh, pretty quickly recovering. Um, and uh, because there was more uh, prey around for the sea lamprey, the ones that survived, the lamprey that was survived, had an increase in their weight. Um, as the trout uh, population started to kind of start to level off, so the weight started to, to uh, go down a little bit in the sea lamprey, perhaps reaching carrying capacity, you might imagine. Um, but then uh, as the trout uh, uh, continued to kind of flatten out here, lamprey increased again. So we're talking about a kind of second lamprey increase starting in the mid-1980s after the prey start to level off. And if you note in the time series in the middle, temperature has also been increasing in a similar time, sort of starting really to tick upwards in about 1980. And so the question is, could the sea lamprey uh, increase in weight here have been driven potentially by warming of the lake? And this is consistent with the observation that the sea lamprey weight is observed to increase from year to year when it's a warmer year and particularly by this metric when there are more days of water at greater than 10 degrees C out in the lake. So this is a graph of the adult sea lamprey weight on the a vertical axis and the number of days at 10 degrees C. So you can see for the very cold year we had a smaller sea lamprey and a very warm year we'd have um, a, a larger sea lamprey in those that are collected. Now we can use our physical model to estimate the days greater than 10 degrees C, how those have changed from uh, the 80s to the 2000s using 79 to 84 as the example period on the top graph here and 01 to 06 on the bottom. And you can see that the red it gets more red, uh, i.e. more days greater than 10 degrees C based on the color scale above uh, in the later period. And we can then take this information about temperature and drive a bioenergetic model of fish and sea lamprey. Uh, this is a uh, basically an energy balance set of equations for multiple fish species and multiple sea lamprey, uh, uh, really pioneered by Jim Kitchell. Uh, and when we include the sea lamprey in that complex set of uh, ecosystem uh, calculations, we can estimate how much the sea lamprey might have changed their consumption of, of blood from fish by sucking that blood out uh, under warmer temperatures. And what we find is up to a 10% increase in blood consumption with the recent warming that occurred uh, by making estimates for 79 to 84 blood consumption rates and 01 to 06 blood consumption rates. Uh, and the dark red is a 10% increase. So you can see that the um, uh, the eastern basin of the lake seems to have had a greater increase in that blood consumption uh, and uh, the western arm lesser. Uh, and this is the kind of information that might be useful to managers who are applying the lamprecide in those streams and rivers because if we think we had a in a, in a kind of real casting, now casting situation, the, the sea lampreys would have had a really good time in the eastern basin in this particular year, well maybe we should be preferentially applying our lamprecide in that area in that year and then moving uh, that preference to another area in a different year. So there are potential connections here to management applications. Okay, the last topic I want to talk to you about today is the issue of um, ocean acidification. Some of my slides have gotten out of order. I don't know how that happened. I apologize. Um, so ocean acidification is um, is a very, very important issue in the global ocean. It's really just hit the hit the, the big stage in the last couple of years. And we want to talk here about how this might be applying to the Great Lakes. So what is ocean acidification? Well, pretty simple chemistry that's been well known for more than 100 years, which is that if you add carbon dioxide to water, you get carbonic acid. That carbonic acid quickly dissociates into bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions, and some of those hydrogen ions recombine with carbon ions to actually make more bicarbonate. The net result is that you get a total increase in the hydrogen ion concentration and a decline in the carbonate ion concentration. And with CO2 emissions since um, 1800, the surface ocean pH has declined about 0.1 units, 
and there's a typo here, it's actually about a 30% increase in the H plus concentration in the surface ocean since uh, 1800. And the question, and so, so one of the implications of that in, is that as we go out in time, here is a model projection for the calcium carbonate saturation state in 2100. It suggests that the Southern Ocean, the whole of the Southern Ocean will actually be corrosive to calcium carbonate uh, by, in the year 2100. And that the impacts of this will likely actually be observed before. And recent studies published in the just past year or so suggest that we're already observing negative impacts on biology uh, by uh, the effects of ocean acidification already. So this is clearly not good for calcifiers, uh, such as mussels and clams and pteropods and coral reefs. And some of the big questions out there right now are what about ecosystem effects? How is this going to scale up uh, in the global oceans to, uh, to ecosystems? Uh, because things like pteropods are really important um, marine snails that are critical food sources for things like whales and large fish. Now our question uh, today is whether the Great Lakes are going to experience this ocean acidification. Uh, our previous work in Lake Superior suggests that the lake uh, is really only a very modest source of CO2 to the atmosphere, unlike some very small lakes uh, that can really be very intense sources of carbon to the atmosphere. And other studies suggest that the other Great Lakes are either weak sources or weak sinks of CO2. There's still a lot of uncertainty, but there's not evidence of a very, a very strong outgassing in any of the Great Lakes. And these sources that do exist are of the same order of magnitude as source regions in the open ocean, like the Equatorial Pacific, that have been shown to acidify, uh, to be acidifying. For example, shown here in the plot uh, of the global ocean. Uh, this region here, the Equatorial Pacific, is a strong outgassing region, and uh, you're getting still strong changes in the pH and saturation state there. So um, what we've done here is assume that the Great Lakes are going to follow the atmosphere of CO2 consistent with our findings of only a weak source or weak thing. We say, well, what if we impose an atmosphere of CO2 on going up into the future based on a business as usual um, kind of emission scenario? calculate, uh, you have some simple physics and a model that just has a, one box for the apollemnion, one box for the hypolemnion, a very simple imposed cycle of productivity, and the complete carbon chemistry, they'll say, if, if the CO2 is like this in the atmosphere, what will happen to the pH of the lakes? So we do this not just for Lake Superior, but for all the lakes, uh, and we build these small models uh, for each of the lakes based on their physics, productivity, and, and make these future projections. And what we find is that, yes, the Great Lakes should experience OA based on this um, uh, process, just as the global oceans. And in fact, the decline in pH uh, is about 0.3 units by 2100, which is quite the same as has been projected for um, for the open ocean. And so these are these are strong trends. Uh, and I have two lines here for each of those five lakes, uh, with the solid being the business as usual scenario, and the dashed being a um, a, a, a one fi uh, a higher emissions scenario. So if you emit more, you're going to get greater uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. You're going to get more declines in pH. And, and the declines are about the same in all of the Great Lakes. Well, this certainly begs the question of whether these kinds of declining trends in pH in the Great Lakes have been observed. And so we've gone into the best uh, monitoring uh, uh, system we have available, which is the EPA biannual survey. And in the bi biannual survey, the, the, there is a, a, a survey out on a boat that goes and takes observations uh, once in April, once in August, at between 8 and 20 sites per lake. And I'm just showing here the sites for Lake Superior, for example. Uh, and what we were using as a surface uh, observations of pH from, uh, from the EPA uh, data. And these data are all available online. And so uh, if we plot that data up, again, red for Superior, blue for Michigan, green for Erie, we see 
of several things. One is um, that there's significant uncertainty in the estimate of pH for the Great Lakes, and that's uh, uh, due to the fact that when we go out and make these observations at all these different points, the point over here might have a very different uh, uh, value than over here, and we use the spatial standard deviation as a estimate of the uncertainty. So there's a lot of spatial heterogeneity indicated by, by these data. You also uh, note some evidence of interannual variability, although frequently those differences are not outside the uncertainty bounds uh, of the observations. Uh, and uh, you also note in superior and area perhaps a recent increase in the pH. Now, if we um, compare this to our predictions from that box model in the black trend, which suggests a declining trend in the pH, you'll note uh, a couple of things again. One, the magnitude of that decline is relatively small compared to the estimated from the observations uh, uncertainty and a variability in time. Um, and so uh, this uh, is, leads us to ask another question, is whether um, we actually have uh, the ability to capture the kinds of trends uh, from, uh, that we're predicting with this box model from those available observations. Because there's only, there's not very many points, uh, considering the scale of these lakes, the size of these lakes, in each of these points here. And there's only April and August data. So what we've done is, again, we've made use of our numerical model and done what's known as an observing system simulation experiment, or an OSI, uh, with our model. What we've done is we've taken the model and sampled it as the data on the same day and at the same time and uh, in the same place as the, um, uh, as the data were collected and compared that to the estimate uh, for the total, the pH, the average pH of the whole lake from all points in space and time in the surface lake for the years 87 to 2001 when we have these data available. And what you'll note here is that uh, the sampling actually does not represent the mean pH of the lake terribly well. It is biased high by the sampling, uh, and it is also has a significant, uh, uh, significantly greater variability in terms of the mean estimate of that pH greater than the um, the true mean as estimated by the model. Now, it's certainly comforting that the size of these uncertainty bars does not encompass the mean, but it's this bias that's really a concern and the greater variability uh, from this sampling uh, that, is, that, that, that is a real concern. And why is this? Uh, the reason for this is because these lakes have a lot of variability going on in their physics, in their biogeochemistry, in their ecology, and that leads to significant spatial temporal variability in the pH. What I'm showing here is maps of just the, the monthly mean pH in April and August, and you can see that there's a wide range in those pHs. And then shown in the next slide, uh, there's significant temporal variability as well. These are the, the Ward instrument put out in June to September 2001, taking out data every 30 minutes. And here is a pH ranging from 8, a point, from eight to pH of 8 up to greater than 8.6 over the course of just a few weeks here because of changing productivity in the surface lake is the most likely reason that occurred. So all of this significant variability uh, can be aliased into the observations as we have them now. And this means that we really don't have a very good handle on what the pH is of the lakes at the large scale. And so our ability to monitor for OA I don't think really exists. So is OA happening in the Great Lakes? Our projections with full carbon chemistry indicate that yes, it should be occurring at the same rate as in, all, in, as in the oceans and all of the lakes. However, our most comprehensive monitoring system really just isn't designed to capture these kinds of trends. And so what we need to do is to have some high quality, high temporal resolution data cited to capture lake-wide means uh, in order to start monitoring for ocean acidification. Uh, and also, we really do need a better understanding of those mechanisms driving the, uh, what is, has been observed as uh, spatial temporal variability as well as modeled uh, so that we can understand how to cite these observations, how to interpret them, and how to really understand how pH might change in the future. 
the last thing I'll mention is that we, we don't have uh, data uh, on what the impacts might be of ocean acidification in the Great Lakes, but we have done a survey of experts, uh, Great Lakes scientists. We had 89 respondents in spring of 2012 asking them what might be the effects of a way on different uh, ecosystem services and organisms in the Great Lakes. Uh, and, and there were a couple uh, summary points here. One is that the calcifying organism certainly has negative effects by most estimates, which actually might be a good thing when we're trying to combat the invasive dressinid mussels, but it's probably going to be an addition, additional stressor on the native populations. Uh, and, and there was less um, uh, uncertainty about that, those effects for those organisms. For something like water quality, um, we thought they'd probably have a weak negative effect or neutral effect by most estimates. And for other things like early life stages of fish uh, and other uh, kind of other, other uh, ecosystem uh, services and, and organisms, we started to see a lot more uncertainty. So this unsure pie really started to grow. And so I, uh, the conclusion here is there's a really a, a lot of uncertainty about what, what might the impacts be and that we uh, need to start also impact studies so we might understand how ocean acidification might act as an additional stressor, stressor on the Great Lakes and when it's combined in, as I said before, nonlinear ways probably with other stressors on our system. So my conclusions are that biogeochemistry and physics really set the stage for our ecosystems, that if we're going to predict responses to climate change, uh, it really requires better knowledge of all these components, that well-validated numerical models that allow us to understand how physical variability, biogeochemical variability connects to ecosystems are really an important tool that we're starting to use to answer some of these questions. And some specific conclusions uh, in terms of the research I've presented indicates that we can uh, balance Lake Superior's carbon budget once we account for the spatial heterogeneity of respiration, um, that Dipari and Lake Superior may be supported by organic carbon fixed on the near shore infected to the slope, uh, that warming has, has had the potential to significantly increase sea lamprey blood consumption in Lake Superior and may be important uh, in their observed increase in weight. And finally, that ocean acidification is likely for the Great Lakes, but that adequate monitoring for this has not yet been implemented. I have just my references here for the benefit of the archive, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Hey, thanks so much. We actually, we've got quite a few questions, so uh, let me get started here. And uh, what questions that Dr. McKinley can answer today, we'll try to post later on the website with her answers. Um, the first question that we had gotten was dealing specifically with uh, uh, macro invertebrate that you, you used. And um, are there any other macro invertebrates to use for other studies, like say in Lake Erie? We had specifically people asking about Lake Erie. Um, so uh, I would have to defer that answer to the people who are really the experts in the benthic communities are. There's mysis, for example, is another important one in Lake Superior, but I do not know as much about uh, Lake Erie benthic communities and macrovertebrates there. Okay. But we could certainly, if we had a numerical model of uh, Lake Erie with a biogeochemical um, uh, component to it, we could make estimates like this for the flow of energy. That doesn't require um, any uh, focus on any particular organism. Okay. Um, one specific uh, question dealing with, and I think it was one of your slides, and I'm sorry, I don't know which number it was, but here's the question. Is the respiration excess in slope zone a result or cause of the dicoria density of the slope and why wouldn't terrestrial input of excess carbon be utilized in near shore, in a near shore environment? Uh -huh. So, um, so we're, we're certainly not suggesting that everything 
from the rivers ends up out on the slope. It's just that it's an equivalent quantity, so that that any that that some, I think probably much of this production actually occurs on the near shore and then gets fluxed out and is replaced by what's coming in from the river. So it's just that in a mass balance sense, this number here, the river input, is about equal to this advection. But in terms of which actual molecules are moving around, uh, we're certainly not saying that it's only the river ones. Um, that are being uh, that are going there, uh, and what we're really doing here is just tracking energy, uh, the availability of labile organic matter, and what might eat it up. In our model, is just simply a return to inorganic carbon and a temperature dependent uh, exponential decay kind of thing. We don't have in in this model the activity specifically of dipariah, but we have an, uh, an idea here that there that that if if temperature is going to if you have a greater temperature, you have more respiration, you have the potential for growth of something to eat that up. Okay. Um, uh, a few questions dealing with uh, lamprey and invasive species. Um, what were the, the cause and effect linkages from increased temperature to increased blood consumption to increased lamprey size? Um, this this uh, participant wanted it, understood that the increased temperature would lead to increased respiration, thereby triggering a need for heavy feeding, but could you clarify why this necessarily led to a larger lamprey? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, you know, I don't think we have a really, uh, a, a, a very um, clear idea of that uh, from uh, the data, except that what we have observed is shown here that we do get greater sea lamprey sizes when they're warmer. And this 10 degrees C is kind of their preferred thermal habitat where they like to operate and they like to find fish that live in that thermal habitat. That's kind of where they like to go. So they're going to be there and they're going to they're going to find prey in that in that zone. So basically they're better able to find prey when there's more uh, water at, um, at, at warmer water and so if we have a greater um, uh, uh, area and, and they also take their clues in terms of when to come out uh, from the streams and when to return to the streams in part from temperature so if they um, are um, uh, if it's warmer for a bit longer in the season, they're already big and they're growing exponentially. Now they've got another week or so to keep sucking and keep growing before they get told, uh-oh, it's getting cold, we need to go back in the streams in order to reproduce. So just that little bit more at the end of the season really can, uh, we think, can really help them uh, uh, to, uh, to get that much more blood out. That's what we think. I don't think we have, uh, and one of the ch challenges here is really understanding how they actually operate and they're not very good laboratory animals uh, and difficult to observe in the wild. So those are the theories. Uh, a follow-up question to that. Um, is that increase then an indication that other invasives will have the same kind of response to warming? We had some people asking like about like Fred Mites, for example. Um, I am. I have not looked at other invasives specifically, but uh, but uh, Val Bennington and, and Jim Kitchell have just recently published a paper, first authored by Timothy Klein, about how fish populations are um, shifting, uh, likely shifting in the lake, and different preference for warmer water uh, fish, um, uh, you know, kind of growing their preference, and colder water fish decreasing their preference. So that has is something that we've looked at, but other invasives is not something that that I have looked at. But I would say that if it's clear that these invasives have some sort of a temperature um, uh, response in them, that they are somewhat dependent on temperature, and something uh, like this warming shown here on this slide, you know, you could make an estimate of how much they might uh, be a, how many, just like in the land, how we think that we've observed longer growing seasons. If your if your invasive kind of is dependent on the length of its growing season, then that probably would have an effect. Uh, one more follow up to this discussion: uh, Do you have any idea as to why the east side of Lake Superior is is so different in, in lamprey uh, blood consumption than the west side? Well, 
in our estimate, uh, so that's this slide here, the, the reason is because the warming we observed, uh, it really is less different uh, in, this, in the western arm than in the eastern arm. There's more increase in the number of days at 10 degrees C in the eastern arm rather than the western arm. That's the reason why in this analysis we get this plot uh, looking like this. And so, um, it, you know, essentially what we found is that the, the, the rates of warming have been greater in the eastern um, side of the lake rather than the western side of the lake, and that would be due to things like um, how much um, ice cover are you having, how much is ice cover changing, and, um, and how is, and is the circulation uh, changing. Uh, so, but I have not looked in great detail at the, the mechanisms of why you have more warming in the east rather than the west. Okay. Um, now, a few questions dealing with um, um, ocean and mm -hmm. um, acidification. Mm -hmm. uh, one question was, does acidification mostly affect species with calcium shells or are there direct effects on non, uh, I'm sorry, no, I'm, I'm, I've missed it, um, on organisms aside from the food web impact? Yeah, so uh, so this is a it's a it's a nice question. Uh, this is something that is really kind of indicative of our development of our understanding of ocean acidification in the open ocean. So the the chemistry of ocean acidification and the physics behind it are, are really pretty straightforward and pretty well understood. Um, so, for example, to develop this model production for calcium carbonate, you know, this is this is this is robust, assuming the amount of CO2 we put in the atmosphere continues to follow a business as usual scenario. The chemistry is pretty solid, and the physics are pretty solid here. But the real questions are, what are the ecosystem impacts? Um, and that's something that the OA community has really been spending a lot of time trying to understand. Certainly, the first targets for that were the calcifiers, and some of the most dramatic examples of negative impact that have been observed and reported in the literature come from, for example, oysters and mussels on the west coast of the U.S., from pteropods in the southern ocean, for example, and from coccolithophores here, and also coral reefs. Have a, it's just one of many stressors on the coral reefs uh, that are very damaging. But I think people are increasingly starting to try to understand how, for example, juvenile fish here might, uh, try to, might be affected by ocean acidification, how might, um, you know, their um, their growth patterns be be modified, for example. So the community of ocean acidification researchers is beginning to branch out and really try to understand that. And then, you know, the ecosystem effects. How does a change in pteropods uh, going to affect uh, higher level ecosystems? That's something we'd really like to understand. But um, uh, we I, we're not there to really have a, a, a totally clear. Um, understanding, but the, the idea is that if we reduce our availability of food uh, by making pteropods less successful in their growth, that we're going to have negative impacts on the ecosystem. That's the best first order uh, assumption, uh, but the proof of that is, is still not been, um, been gathered. Um, so we think that the effects will be um, broad and not really exclusively to calcifiers, but the most best documented effects so far have been on calcifiers. Okay. Um, and a few questions dealing with um, um, pH levels in the Great Lakes. Uh, one question was, how do or why do the current pH levels differ among the Great Lakes? Right. So, for example, here, uh, it, it's largely because the alkalinity or the charge balance of the lakes is different. So, Lake Superior has a very low alkalinity and very a low pH because it sits in a granite basin, um, while the other lakes sit on uh, carbonate uh, rock and have a much higher alkalinity. Huron is sort of between, um, for example, Michigan and Superior, in part because it's, it's both got its own influences, but then it's also getting water from Superior with the lower alkalinity. Uh, and one uh, clarifying question, uh, people were asking um, why is pH going up in the lake? Because uh, there was a reference that, that you had said that pH was going down due to acidification. Right, so this is this is exactly the point I'm trying to make here. By these plots that I'm showing here, uh, the from the EPA estimates, pH is going up. 
but our other uh, studies suggest that these are actually not a very good estimate of the lake-wide pH, uh, that there's too much uncertainty. If you look at these uncertainty bounds on these observations, you can't say that that downward trend is not occurring, um, for example, in Lake Michigan, because there's such uncertainty in those ob observations that are there, if you believe that those observations are accurate. The Aussie here, the Observing System Simulation Experiment, indicates that those observations are actually not accurate and are unable to capture the true annual mean pH of the Great Lakes and that we need a different approach. So I don't, what I'm saying is that yes, these data suggest an upward trend, but that's not a good estimate of the lake wide mean. Okay. Uh, one, another question dealing with it um, someone had asked, um, have you thought about the effects of acid rain on acidification in the Great Lakes? Is there a way to measure that out to know which is coming from uh, carbon dioxide and which from acid rain? Uh, well, so the, the difference, there's a big difference between the chemistry here uh, uh, with acid rain and the chemistry uh, with, uh, with ocean acidification. So acid rain uh, occurs with the disassociation of strong acids uh, in water and occurs largely over decadal time scales. Uh, and kind of localized in regions of small, typically in smaller lakes with a, with a low buffer capacity. But with CO2, it's a weak acid, but there's a kind of an infinite source in the atmosphere. Uh, and so nothing, not even the global oceans, are big enough to avoid it. And so this, this effect is going to continue over long time scales, um, uh, assuming that atmospheric CO2 concentrations continue to rise as we all expect them to to do uh, so, um, it, it's a difference between a strong acid and a weak a strong acid getting diluted in a very large system versus a weak acid with an infinite source. Um, and so, um, the observations don't indicate large impacts of acid rain on the Great Lakes, but, but this is a different um, a different effect. Okay. Um, one uh, last question, as we're at uh, one o'clock right now. Um, Someone had asked, um, how, in your opinion, how, what could be mostly affected in the Great Lakes if acidification occurs? You hear about the huge problems with acidification with the oceans, but how big of an effect will it have on, in your opinion, uh, will it have on the Great Lakes ecosystem and its species? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, very great question. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is, that is the million dollar question, really. So I think um, we, there's a lot we don't understand, as I said in the introduction, about the complex interactions between variety of stressors in the Great Lakes, whether it's invasive species or toxics or climate change, all these things, they're not just individual linear effects uh, that can be added, they're probably going to have nonlinear effects. And um, so that's where we need to go eventually to try to understand those complex nonlinear interactions, but, uh, but we are not there yet to really understand that. So. Um, so I think we need to begin those studies. I think, you know, at first order, I would say uh, uh, ocean acidification in the Great Lakes probably will help our, uh, you know, getting rid of the mussels uh, because it's going to be hard on them with lower pH. There is evidence that they don't like the lower pH at various stages in their development. Um, it's probably uh, not going to be good for fish development uh, based on studies in the open ocean. Um, but I think uh, we really have a lot of, uh, of work that needs to be done uh, first in terms of understanding what the trends are, uh, understanding what, what drives and what really causes all this spatial variability in pH in the Great Lakes, what are the mechanisms, and so that then we can start to say, well, how might this interact with other effects such as um, invasives and climate change and uh, warming, that is, and other, and other effects. But that, I wish I knew, but that's where I hope maybe we'll know by the end of my career. Okay, thank you. Well, um, this, this has been a, a, a great presentation. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk with us today. Um, we are, at, it is after one o'clock, so I wanted to end um, with that question. Uh, a great discussion, we really appreciate it. We also wanted to thank uh, NOAA and the National Sea Grant College Program and Ohio State University for funding this webinar. I did want to remind everyone that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature. Uh, please take a few minutes to fill that out. We'd like your input as we develop a regional climate site, so please take the time if you could. 
Also, I wanted to refer you to references in the archive of all the previous webinar presentations, which are located on our changingclimate.osu.edu website. Uh, again, this webinar series is sponsored by the OSU Climate Change Outreach Team and will continue next month. We'll email you when speakers are confirmed and registration is open. Uh, thank you again to Dr. McKinley and all the participants of this webinar. We hope this was beneficial and hope you'll join us again next month. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you, Dr. McKinley. Thank you.